Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Downs. This talk is a roadmap to the future of teaching and learning. It's online educator Berlin. That's for the audio recording, December 7, 2017. And I've got about five minutes with you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I've set my timer for 25 minutes. That will take us into lunch a bit, but uh, if you want to leave partway through the talk, please feel free. I won't feel insulted at all. I know how important lunch is. Believe me. <laughs> and so there's the roadmap. <laughs> Nothing confused at all. Um, I, I see the future of teaching and learning as online. I love basements, but that's not the future, thank you. Um, and it's not the future simply because in order to provide learning for 7 billion people on this planet, you have to think scale, you have to think technology, you have to go beyond the things that have been done in the past. This is a roadmap that leads us in that direction. A lot of these topics will be familiar to you. What I've done is I've gone through some of the major areas there, pulled out some things, and those are the things that I will concentrate on. Okay, timer works only if it's visible. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. That's the plan. These slides are available at that website after, and assuming the video recording and the audio recording work properly, the audio and the video will also be available at that website. And that's part of the future of teaching and learning. We, we have this idea that it's a static thing, we prepare it all ahead of time, uh, it's done in long formal increments, but the future of teaching and learning is more stuff like this, creating resources on the fly, sharing them quickly, rapidly, and of course, open and free. And that's for the purpose of making education available to everyone. So let's look at that roadmap in a little bit more detail. We'll begin with offering and publishing. Offering and publishing is where a lot of online learning begins. Certainly it's where distance education begins. We think course packages. Those of us who've been around for a little bit think about things like learning objects. The biggest trend over the last 15, 20 years probably has been the modularization of learning content, contracting from books, contracting from full length courses to something shorter, something more portable, something shareable, something rediscoverable. As we move forward, into the next five and 10 years. Our learning content is going to become even more fluid, even more temporary and transient. If you're in the business of producing resources for learning as though they were books or publications, you're in the wrong business. We need to think of learning resources as something that can be created today, used tomorrow, and discarded next week because it's out of date. That's the world we live in. It's kind of chaotic and hard to get used to, but that's the world. So I've highlighted two major trends here, open data and data books. Open data is the idea that data from the environment will be freely available, sometimes at a charge, but generally accessible to any learning environment. We're talking government data, employment data, consumer resource data, your personal data, whatever, it will be available to learning tools and devices. That also leads us to what has been called data books. I think, for example, of something called the Jupyter Notebook, where you have a book-like resource with live, actionable data embedded right in the resource, so that you read the book, you can change the code in the book, and get different data, different resources, updated on the fly. If you're not looking at data books, you should be looking at data books. Learning activities. We've had a lot of talk about learning activities. There are sessions in this conference about games and gamification and things like that. 
uh, virtual reality. You know, I've been giving talks on some of this stuff for many years. Uh, I remember about 10 years ago denouncing something called Second Life at a conference in London, and the audience wanted to attack me. Um, but who's using Second Life today? That's the reality of a lot of these immersive simulations. They take your total attention, uh, even more than television, even more than movies. And because they do, you can't be doing anything else. And because of that, these things, while they're very powerful, are always going to be niche applications. You'll use them for a bit. You'll use them for an hour or two, or if you're like me, three, and then you'll go back to the rest of your life. What we're going to see in the area of learning activities is more and more learning combining with the other things that you do. That's a tennis racket. You probably knew that from the picture. But that tennis racket is connected with a learning application. You can sort of see it there in the handle. It connects to, well, maybe your phone or something similar. As you practice playing tennis, the uh, whatever you call the gizmos inside, not GPS, but the thing that measures your swing and that. They're recording your activity and sending data back into your phone, and your phone is telling you, look, you're not following through properly, or look, you need a different bracket, or look, tennis isn't your sport. <laughs> um, this is a thing that they had to at Disney, it's called a magic band, because it's Disney, right? And uh, it tracks you as you go through Disneyland or Disney World, but it also lets you get into activities. You interact with uh, displays and whatever it knows who you are. Your world is your teaching device. Your world is your teaching environment. So think of learning activities not as something that you're doing in front of the computer anymore, not as something that you do in a special place or a special room. Learning is something that we're going to be doing every minute of every day. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Collaboration and social media, a lot of this stuff has come on stream already. If I wanted to and I felt confident with the bandwidth, I could be live streaming this now on, on Google Live or, or YouTube Live or I don't know if live stream still exists, but there are, you know, there are other options. That's only going to get better over time. Uh, a lot of these conferences have back channels. I could have a little thing in my ear to listen to comments as we're going, or I could have a separate screen and so on. So a lot of that is really coming into the fore. The big thing that is going to happen, and I've highlighted it there, automated translation. Uh, Google's Pixel, whatever it is, uh, phone uh, doesn't have an earphone jack, for which they should be cursed, just like Apple, but still. Uh, the way they're selling this is uh, earbuds that do automated, automatic translation on the fly. Now, if, you know, generation 0 0.1 of this technology, it's flaky. It's only going to get better. It's not going to get worse. So as we're going through our day, you could be speakers of Mandarin or Swahili or Urdu or whatever, not speak English at all, but still follow this talk or an online conversation because of your automated translation. That changes the game. It creates a truly global environment, not just you know, an English world, a Chinese world, a Hindi world, etc. Resource bases and sources. This is astonishingly an almost mature technology. We can store pretty much anything online now. Um, you know, and we've got publication databases, course repositories, we've got uh, app stores and things like that. The big thing, it's been a thing for a while. I'm hoping that this is a prediction and not a wish, but I'll live with it either way. Open educational resources. We're seeing now some of the major publishers finally adapting open educational resources, reluctantly dragging their fingernails on the floor, trying not to do open educational resources if they can possibly avoid it, 
But the thing is, we have entered the era of free content. The massive open online course, the keyword there is open, and that allowed people to imagine that resources could be free and freely available around the world. The momentum there, even if you think MOOCs are dead, open online content is not dead, and I think it's only increasing. Learning environments, big changes in the wind here. Um, the, the learning management system is not yet dead, and it's not yet dead only because it has a ridiculous install base. Uh, all, the, all large companies and large institutions are using them, but the learning management system itself is beginning to change. The, uh, the providers of learning management systems don't want them to be called that anymore. They want them to be called learning platforms. And the reason for this is, formerly, in a learning management system, everything took place inside the learning management system. It was a sealed box, practically. You didn't even need to be online, really. All you needed is access to your learning management system and you were away to the races. Today, however, we're seeing more and more the idea of other things integrating into the learning management system. The model of this, of course, is things like Facebook, which is a platform, and you have these apps you can put into Facebook where you, I don't know, chase candy crushes or whatever, play games and try to steal your money. Um, learning management systems will have more useful apps. Uh, you know, the uh, open data that I've just talked about will be included among those. The uh, collaboration and communication that I've just talked about will be included among those. A technology that's now reasonably well established is learning tools interoperability. This allows your learning management system to launch an external application and for the external application to communicate back with the learning management system in a relatively synchronized way. So think of your learning management system of the future as a platform and then a, a range of different applications surrounding that learning management system. But now take that a step further. Why do only institutions get learning management systems? Why do only corporations get learning management systems? I think, and I've been saying this for a number of years, and I still don't think I'm wrong, that the future of these systems is the personal learning environment. I think that each of us will have our own personal learning platform. Our personal learning platform will access courses from multiple providers. We're already seeing the need for this. It's in the world of MOOCs and MOOC providers now. You can take a MOOC from edX, from Coursera, from wherever, but we've also got open educational resources, thousands, millions of open educational resources, along with communication tools, Mastodon, even Twitter, if you still use Twitter, um, all of these can be brought into your personal learning environment. Your personal learning environment can be where you do your study, your work, um, and then share your resources with your own network of mentors, of friends, of colleagues, and even of students. So that's where I believe that's headed. All of this is supported with a framework which I'll, I'll, for lack of a better term, call aggregation and metadata, and with a nod to calendaring. I had a, um, a computer developer, software developer say, calendaring has been solved. And yeah, in a certain technical sense, calendaring has been solved, but my question is, why can't Outlook work with Google? Uh, Google Calendar. So, from my perspective, perspective, not solved. Um, so, we need syndication, aggregation, and even metadata. We need these systems talking to each other. We're slowly moving in that direction. Again, the companies, the corporations, the providers, they're, you can see their fingernails on them, dragging on the floor as they resist 
the idea that you might want to use somebody else's content, somebody else's calendar, but we're moving in that direction. We are getting more integrated applications. What's pushing this? Well, it used to be RSS. Then Google did its level best to kill RSS by shutting down the feed reader and making RSS feeds invisible in the Chrome browser. But aggregation continued. It was one of the cores of our massive open online courses. Aggregation continues today in things like application programming interfaces and something called JSON, JavaScript Object Locate. JavaScript object notation, which is the new way of sharing structured data. You may have been brought up in a world of XML and semantic web and OWL and ontologies and all of that, but what's actually being used in a lot of these applications is JSON, which is a much more free-form kind of data. If I want to create data in JSON, I just call it something. If I want to give it a property, I just name a property and then give it a value. And that's all, all you have to do. There's a lot of work happening in that area. I run a MOOC aggregator at MOOC.ca. Uh, the MOOC providers, to, for the most part, make their data available in JSON. And because they're all commercial, they all use different formats because goodness knows they could never use the same format as some other provider. I'm a bit <laughs> this is leading to cloud apps and storage. Uh, you already use this, probably. Uh, if you have Google Drive, if you have OneDrive, if you have Apple's thing that takes you money called iCloud, uh, there's Box, BoxNet, uh, Dropbox, etc. There, there's more, right? If you're storing your data on that, you're using this. Um, now, what's happening over time is that not just data, but applications themselves are applications themselves are moving into the cloud. I did a seminar yesterday called Grasshopper in a Box. Grasshopper is my prototype learning uh, personal learning environment. It's not in the books, but the big thing that I did for this seminar is I put it in something called a vagrant box. Now you might think, oh, it's a big deal, you put an insect in a box. Well, um, but the thing is, now that it's in a box, I can put that box in the cloud and anybody can get a copy of that box and run it wherever they want. Or if I want, I could give you each your own instance of a grasshopper just by giving your, your own copies of this box. And it just it comes out, and basically it's a completely self-contained com computer that runs in a software environment. Over time, oh, I don't have one in my pocket. Usually I have a US, one of those USB sticks in my pocket. Over time, your computer will just be a USB stick. Your learning environment will be on that USB stick. You just plug it in wherever you happen to be. You have all of your learning resources, all of your performance support resources available right there. That's where this is going in the future. So I put personal cloud as the big red, this is the thing that's going to be happening. But by personal cloud, not just data, your own personal applications in the cloud, but not the sort of cloud where if you stop paying them, it goes away. The sort of cloud where you can unplug it and take it with you wherever you want and plug it in somewhere new. So I think that that's going to be pretty significant. Must be lunch to think of. <laughs> Um, competencies and skills, the corporate world is all over this. Um, they're spending a lot of money and a lot of time, probably too much money and too much time. I'm kind of a skeptic about a lot of this because a lot of this is semantically based. It's old style artificial intelligence. It's old style expert systems kind of thinking. It's not new style neural networks, deep learning kind of thinking. So I, I would exercise caution before investing too much time and too much energy into competencies. That said, 
all of the learning management systems are doing. Um, the idea here is to define a competency, and that's what on the left, and then assess the learner's state of expertise in that competency, and that's what's indicated on the right, the yellow, the red, and the green. This is something from the U.S. Advanced Distributed Learning. It's part of an overall project that they call Competencies and Skills Systems. And that's part of ADL's larger project called a Total Learning Architecture. Only the U.S. military can call something like that. Um, but really, you know, questions with competencies and assessments, I think, go to motivations. How do we accurately represent a person's knowledge? And even more to the point, what are the person's own motivations to have their skills and knowledge accurately represented as opposed to inaccurately and often falsely recommended or uh, recognized? Uh, I think there's a big issue there, uh, an issue that people haven't necessarily grasped yet. And I think in the long term, assessment of a person's overall competencies will resemble the way uh, essays are automatically graded today. Not by looking for features, not by looking for specific behaviors or specific performances, but by using neural networks to compare previously successful performances, a thousand essays that were given a grade of A, for example, with the current performance. And you get uh, a, a mechanism that says, yes, this is one of those, or no, this is not one of those, based on, you know, if, if you have a su sufficiently detailed neural network, thousands of data points, tens of thousands of data points, rather than the simplified representation you get in the semantic web or in the competency framework. Lots of stuff to talk about there. Learning records kind of follow from semantic web, kind of doesn't. Everybody's talking about blockchain. First person that I heard talk about blockchain in education was not Don Tapscott, uh, it was Don Belshock, and he's been working in badges for a long time. He was thinking of blockchain as a mechanism for uh, establishing the credentials of badges. I think credentials are kind of important, but I think your own personal public performance is more important. My video of this talk is a much better representation of whether I know what I'm talking about than any certificate or credential or degree or whatever it could be. If you have experts in the field and they say, yeah, he knows what he's talking about, that's probably a pretty good credential. But if people look at this and they say, huh, that's nonsense. Uh, I can't get past that with a university degree. It's just not going to apply. And I, so I think that we need to be careful again with blockchain. Blockchain is great for verifying data, but you have to be sure that the data that's being verified was actually data that you needed and wanted. If you haven't done that, then you're spending a lot of money to verify something that you didn't really need. It's like buying a very large safe and and putting a, a pair of cufflinks in it. <laughs> okay, bad analogy. That's what I get for making up an analogy on the fly. <laughs> analytics, again, everybody's talking analytics. Analytics, we love analytics. Uh, people in the time, that guy came up there is from 1998. So that's how long this idea has been around. Please don't be fooled by these companies coming along and saying, we've got analytics, nobody ever has any. It's been around for a long time. Really some basic analytics, right now, analytics is the application of the mathematics of probability to data sets, that's all it is. And so it's used to do things like clustering, it's used to do things like entity and image recognition, it's used to do things like a little bit of projection, people who did this will probably fail, people who did that will probably pass. And that's kind of the limit of analytics at the moment and for the foreseeable future. Analytics is not going to take people who are failing and make them pass. It will tell you why they're failing, but it won't make them pass. That's a really important distinction in my mind. Now, I think that the real future of analytics is not 
uh, you know, the dashboards that learning providers run in, in what I call quantified stuff. So what is quantified stuff? If I go for a bike ride, um, I take this with me, it tracks where I went, how fast I went, how far I went, what my speed is per kilometer, etc. Right? That motivates me to go faster. That tells me how I'm doing. That tracks my improvements. Personal quantified analytics of the self are probably going to be the thing that actually has the greatest impact on performance. Development, this is uh, software development, application development, resource development is becoming less of a silo enterprise, less of a case where you have the computer people and the design people and the delivery people as becoming much more integrated. Technologies like Slack, Airtable, Trello are creating these multidisciplinary content development teams. Uh, and these, these teams start up, do something on the fly, and then disband on an as needed basis. It's kind of a chaotic work environment. You need the culture to make that work. You need the culture where people don't do the same thing for a year, two years, or whatever. That's a hard culture to sustain. And I think a lot of companies are going to have a lot of difficulty with it. My own government agency is trying, but having a lot of difficulty with it. Um, another thing, and I think this is, and I think this is my final note on this talk, open pedagogy. What I mean by that isn't just teachers doing in their class what they do openly and sharing, although it does mean that. It means me sharing my talk on a video or live or whatever, but it also means all of you in whatever job you're doing, whether it's truck driver, airline pilot, scuba diver, Antarctic explorer, or whatever, sharing in real time the activities you undertake, the skills you deploy, the learning you get on the fly, what the results were. That's where our future content of development will be. It's not going to be done in design houses and production houses. It's going to be done by a community of practitioners for that community of practitioners. And that is the kind of educational environment that we want to be designing for and working toward. I did a paper, I love this paper, it's about, I don't know, 60 pages or so, um, that looks at some of these and goes beyond a lot of those and talks about the nature of change as well as the nature of technology. That's available at that website there, bit.ly slash quantum least. Somebody else picked the title. <laughs> um, and that's me and that's my website. I thank you very much for your time. Eating into your lunch hour, I really appreciate it. <laughs> and of course, I'll take questions. That's a question. Follow the bouncy box. Can you speak to the box? Oh, right. Speak into the box. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Um, so we'll be talking about the sharing economy. What is your thoughts on kind of data and data? Because obviously that's going to be a big deal. What, what's defined it to me as I'm building my own personal learning path? And what's my motivation to share? So at some point, first of all, we have to recognize that your data is yours. That's a big social political hurdle we're going to have to get past for a lot of this to be of any use to you. I think we will get past it. I don't think it will be easy. Once it's yours, now it's, I don't want to say it's a commodity because that turns into everything into economics and I don't mean that at all. But there is the exchange factor. The more you share, the more you get back. I share my mobility data, I get back an analysis of how my bike ride went. Um, but the idea is that I can share it on a selective basis. But it's not just that either. Why am I sharing this video? I don't have to share the video. Um, you know, I'll get paid the same thing, which by the way is nothing. Um, <laughs> either way, right? 
but I want to share the video because I think it's useful and I think other people should want to see it. Um, not everybody has that motivation, but if enough people do, then you've got enough of the system set up. So that's part of it. Companies and institutions will want to share because they have a product and they don't want people to break the product or to assemble the product incorrectly um, or you know, use the product in an appropriate, inappropriate way. So that's one of the things. Um, companies will want to share for their employees to help them learn, to help them develop, to help them work. You know, in this sharing uh, or this uh, new collaborative workflow kind of environment, they need to be trained, they need to be brought up to speed, uh, they need to have fingertip access to resources, so that's a big motivation for them. Governments, social services, hospitals, the tax department, they all want you to learn. So there's no shortage of incentive in the world on the part of individuals or on the part of organizations. Uh, United Airlines had a thing called Channel 9. I don't know if they still have it, because I haven't flown United for years, because I don't travel to the US much these days. But uh, they, Channel 9 was basically, you could listen to the pilots of the airplane talk to air traffic control. I loved that. I, I spent the whole flight from San Diego to Chicago listening to Channel 9 and looking out the window. It was brilliant. Why are they doing that? Because it makes people flying on the plane feel more comfortable and it's cheaper than paying for video. Uh, it's United after all. You know, all kinds of motivations exist. And so I think there's, there's on the motivation side for sharing, I don't think there's an issue. Uh, on the ownership side for sharing, I think there is. And that's the thing that we have to work out. Do more people want to speak into the box? <laughs> it's styrofoam, don't worry. That, that box is the greatest invention I've seen. And, and it's almost unique to online education. Um, in this um, open sharing environment, what do you think will be the role of universities and institutes for learning and content development? It depends on the institution, right? Um, community colleges still have a major role to play because you can only earn, learn well from doing well, um, for example. Uh, so now what's going to be the case though is they will be more like places where you go to practice welding rather than places where you go to listen to lectures about welding. But you know, that's kind of the model of community college anyways, right? So they will remain to a large degree unchanged. I hope they will become more popular and spread more through society and become recognized um, to a much greater degree as important institutes of learning, which they are. Uh, and, and I hope that the subject areas increase. Although, you know, they're pretty wide range now, everything from cuisine to agriculture to welding to electricity, etc. Um, academic institutions are in more trouble, honestly, and we're already seeing that with them closing, with them merging, with them losing students, um, and facing greater regulatory hurdles. They split right away into two types of, of institutions, teaching institution or research institution. By and large, the research institutions have been trying to pay for what they're doing by getting research contracts. Depends on the country you're in, how well this works. If you're in the US, someone's always willing to pay, you know, Yale or Harvard or Stanford or whatever. If you're in Canada, uh, the government pays for most of it, and there's virtually no private investment, and that's true for most countries of the world. Um, without government support for these institutions, these institutions are in trouble. And they will either uh, find a way to market the research through patents and licensing, etc., get funding from governments or and philanthropy, or they will fail. Simple, as simple as that. Um, the teaching institutions also have difficulties. They are going to have to transition from 
program-based uh, learning to, I don't want to say occasional learning or informal learning because that's too informal, but um, they're, they're going to have to unbundle a lot of what they're doing. Uh, so, for example, take, take the activities that a typical teaching university or the uh, lectures. Uh, they'll still do those lectures, but they'll be like this lecture, they'll be broadcast, they'll be made available online, they'll be funded by government or by endowments, etc., not by tuition, because why would you fund, why would you pay tuition to, you know, we'll come back to that in a sec. Um, production of learning resources like books and things, probably not as much. I, I think book publishing is probably on the decline. Uh, publishing in general is on the incline. If you look at other other industry, look at music and video, for example. We're in a golden age of music and video production right now. I don't think people realize that because we pay so little for it now. Um, but uh, you know, in terms of the amount of say music, the amount of music, the channels of music available to me now, as compared to say when I was a teenager, there's no comparison. Um, I have access now to hundreds of thousands of artists that I like, as opposed to six radio stations, one of which I like, which sometimes doesn't play disco for an hour. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's night and day, it really is. It's, I grew up in the 70s, it was this whole anti-disco thing. And the reason why that that existed is because that's all you could get. Um, today, there, there would be no point in an anti-disco movement. Why would you bother? Um, learning content is moving in that direction now. We're moving to a golden age of learning content. We're moving to uh, some companies are offering flat rate subscriptions to courses and learning materials. Uh, right now, these are too expensive, just like the early music offerings are too expensive. Expect them to level out in the $10 a month range for unlimited learning content. That's probably, and it'll be like that because if you don't want to pay for that, you've got an equally large volume of slightly less professional material as open educational resources. So it's going to be in that range. And your business models are going to have to be. But for each consumer, you're getting $10. That's your model. And you have to make it work from there. Um, the key thing that we need to keep in mind, the universities, and especially the elite universities, they do not their product is not research. And they do it, but that's not their product. Nor their product is not learning, teaching and learning and giving people an education. They do that too. I think they do it kind of indifferently. I've seen graduates from Harvard and Yale, but no great shades, really. So what are they charging for? They're charging for networking. They're charging for connections. When you get into Harvard or Yale, you have succeeded, right? And then everything else is great. Right? Now you can say, I'm a, I was in Harvard, right? Uh, I'm a Harvard educated accountant. Yeah, I attended one day. <laughs> Harvard, right? Uh, it's the name, it's the network. Um, you know, when you're looking for it, you can't stop seeing it. If you look at media in the United States, especially, look at who's writing the media. They're all from Harvard or Yale or Stanford. They have their little network. Um, and they support each other. That is the market of the future. Not helping these rich people perpetuate their own networks. Um, but helping other people who are not rich have that same capacity, form their own networks, create your own self-supporting groups, um, you know, create mechanisms that help people collaborate, etc. To have the same advantage for everybody as what I call the Yale advantage is for Yale's today. I can go on. <laughs> you probably should not ask about five people there with the network. <laughs> I've got another question, if I'm, if I may. If nobody else has. 
sorry, I'm, I'm hogging the tunnel. Um, just something on the impact of automation. So we know that, so in terms of the, we've talked about delivery, but in terms of the content of what we're doing, we know some skills are going to be more resistant to automation than others. Yeah. How do you see that playing out in, in the content that's actually That's a really good point, and I don't really address automation in those slides, and yet I use it all the time. I have a newsletter which, well, actually, forget the newsletter. When I lived in Moncton, I had something called Moncton Free Press, which was a local newspaper. It was digital or it's online only. It was better than the local print newspaper, which honestly was the rain. But maybe I'm biased. But it ran itself. Um, I had a list of content providers. Uh, they were all the political parties, uh, the city government, the, uh, the provincial government, the federal government, various news agencies, bloggers, sports organizations, service clubs, chamber of commerce, and a list of a couple of hundred providers. My aggregator aggregated that automatically. It didn't have to do anything. Every once in a while, I prove the list of providers. Um, then I run it through content analysis, which would separate the content into you know, local, provincial, sports, business, environment, etc., which created all of the different pages. These pages would update every day with fresh results, and then the software would package it and export it as RSS or send it as your email newsletter. Completely automatic. Um, and it was a really good newspaper. I read it every day. Uh, so I think automation is going to hit, and it's going to do a lot for us. Right now, automation is too hard. Uh, it took me ages to set that up. I spent more time setting up the automation. Well, no, that's a bit exaggerated, but it, it took me a long time to set it up. Once I set it up, it ran itself and would have done so into perpetuity if I wanted to keep paying the $24 a month for internet service provider. Um, automation in, in terms of, you know, there's, I was reading something, uh, automation is going to change the shape of cities uh, because we're using automated vehicles. Um, we're finally going to get our flying cars, but we won't be allowed to drive them. Um, they'll be automated. So I think automation is going to have a major impact. I think most of the impact is going to be social, economical, political. Um, I don't think it. I don't think it impacts the predictions that I've made here, but it makes some of the things that are currently hard a lot easier. Like sharing, we talk about what is the motivation for sharing. Right now, it's a lot of work to share, but if it's just you know clicking the share button on your phone, that's a totally different story, right? Um, if in a room like this, you know, we have ambient quiet drones around, and I can pull in the feed broadcast that just by clicking a button. No problem. Now, now sharing becomes something really feasible. And in fact, now we have too much sharing. So I need more automation to filter the sharing. Um, that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of environment we'll be in. Long term, the impact of automation, and this is really important since it's been so few people are left, because uh, I should have said this when I get competencies, that whole competency thing, that whole idea of education for job training and employability, with automation, the need for that drops dramatically. Social productivity goes through the roof. You ever look at the auto industry? Right? Um, productivity goes through the roof. We don't need to have anything like full employment anymore to be a full productive capacity. Right now, even as a society, we overproduce uh, dramatically, which is why there's so much waste. Um, you know, the, the big problem when you produce stuff is how to get people who want to, to want it. Um, so, if there are no real jobs or very few real jobs in the future, what are we doing now? Why are we training people for jobs now? Okay, next five years, okay, I kind of see it. But, you know, imagine going you know, some places are already talking about guaranteed incomes and things like that, where you could get by just fine without actually working. And then why are we training these people to work? 
Um, so it changes it changes the power dynamics of who is demanding what in learning. And it means that a person is learning because they're interested in learning, they want to pursue such and such. And that means we have to reorient our thinking to enabling the person to do what it is that they want rather than what it is that they have to do to avoid starvation. Totally different dynamic. Totally different relationship between the instructor and the student. Right now, as an instructor, I'm in a position of power. I give you an F. Your income for the rest of your life drops by $10,000 a year. You only live in an apartment, not a house. Right? That's way too much power. Um, and I will do that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Take away that power and the dynamics changes dramatically. And that's in our future. It's in the longer term future, but that's in the future. Um, robots, first of all, will, will replace workers. Um, before they replace government or anything else, they'll replace workers. And, and we have to figure out how to deal with that. Already, uh, the developing world. Too many people, not enough jobs. Their only issue, their issue isn't the lack of jobs. Because then they would be producing a whole bunch of stuff that nobody needs. Their issue is the lack of wealth. Uh, a lack of proper wealth redistribution. So I, I think that these kind of issues are going to be crucial for the future of, of education. The alternative to that, because it's not a guarantee, I was there is no inevitable future, is society splits into two. Um, the wealthy, in which case our job will be to help them stay wealthy, and the rest, uh, we don't do anything for them. Um, that's the alternative. Now, you know, there are various shades of gray in between, but either we're preparing ourselves for a world in which the productive capacity helps all of us, or we're preparing for a world that is very deeply divided. One or the other. You know which one I choose. Because I'm not willing, and I never will be. Anything else? I can lose more people if you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> Do have an audio recording. Yay! <laughs>